and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open our studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest for Talk Art, Michael Endicott, is a photographer and contemporary digital artist who creates abstract images by digitally bending the wavelengths of the light that's inherent in his photographs. So welcome, Michael. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about how you got into photography. What interested you about it? Well, I grew up in the Caribbean, and as such, nature was all around me, and I had the uh, camera with me at all times. And I was very interested in capturing the moments that make up the stories that are the serendipity of our lives. Right. And so that's what first started my interest in it. And then I got fascinated by the colors and just producing the photographs. And that's where I got going. What, what tools do you use these days? I mean, growing up, you probably used film. But what tools do you use today? Uh, yeah, so today I use uh, a Nikon. Um, D750, a digital version mm -hmm. of uh, the camera. I started with the D90, which was the opposite of my analogs to step right. up. And then the D750 is what I use mostly now. And then, of course, there's always the cell phone. The key thing is to get the photograph one way or another if you see it out there. Right. So when you're walking around, what are you looking for? When you see an image, how do you know that that's going to be a, a, an image that you can work with? Well. First of all, sometimes there's, if there's, um, it's a nature shot, then there's just beauty, the sheer beauty of what you're doing. And you want to turn around and make the moment more real almost or capture it for yourself. But for the abstract style of art or the storytelling that I'm interested in, which is the intersection of nature uh, and what man does, I'm looking for strong contrasts of light, okay. strong shapes that help make you know, clear what the message is. And sometimes it's just the patterns that are inherent in it the combinations of the two. Uh, hmm. and, or it's something that makes you think. So you're walking down the street, I'm always looking. The first right. thing that captures you and what you're looking for is just be looking. Uh, and that's the luxury of being a photographer, is that you have the time to look and the desire. Well, excellent. Well, you have some images of nature that are very interesting, very strong images. So let's take a look at those now. You can talk a little bit about them. OK, that's great. So uh, this first one here is of a pelican actually on a day that I was feeling blue about because the clouds were so low and so white and I was looking for a blue sky. And so when I, but I took the picture because the bird was beautiful. But when I went home and developed it, I said, oh my goodness, look at this. It actually now looks like an Audubon drawing. It does. So it actually turned out to be a big benefit of the clouds. And that's why I kind of say, always take the picture. Um, pelicans are a fascinating bird to me, and it's what I feel kind of maybe is my spirit bird. These are two pelicans off of Ocean Beach up here in San Francisco. They're part of my series, which is I would fly with you forever if you would let me. Interesting. So when you take a photo like that, can you tell us a little bit about the settings in your cameras? So that one was on a very gray day, again. The pelicans actually weren't light, but the sun was setting, so there was a lot of gold inherent in the background of the light. So I'm shooting probably with a little bit of underexposure, setting the step down a couple of notches. This here is in the bottom of the middle fork of the Salmon River. Uh, a friend of me took us fly fishing there, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely spectacular. And this, to me, is what nature is all about. It is its own cathedral. So that's another reason that I love being a photographer, is that it's being out in nature's church. Uh, this here is at the top of Mont Blanc. Uh, I did not walk up this way. I cheated and took the cable car up to the mm -hmm. top. And these are people, though, climbing to the top. But what fascinates me about this is that, as you saw, whether it's in water or mountains, the shapes are always the same. And you see the wave patterns here in the frozen snow. And then in playing with the light a little bit, you really get to see how the sh various layers of snow that fell on it, which have those different colors. Yeah, I can see that, definitely. So what inspires you when you're out there 
And you say you just, you're looking for things, you're always looking, but when, what inspires you? Why do you take photographs like this? Well, as I was growing up and before I became a full-time photographer, I've always been interested in, in the intersection between man and nature. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started off as a marine biologist, having I mean, started off in the Caribbean, that's pretty mm -hmm. easy to see. And then I became an environmental attorney. Uh, oh, wow. And that was kind of, I've always been seeing how does man create their environment, which is sort of a subset environment that fits in the host environment that's created by nature. And when we build something to control nature, then nature tends to respond to it and talk back to us. And that becomes right. a constant feedback loop between us that affects us both uh, spiritually, culturally, and physically. And that's the part that I'm really interested in. So when you make an abstract image from a photograph, it, that's what you're thinking of, that intersection between yourself and the, what you see and what's out there in nature. Uh, yeah, interesting. that's it. Um, yeah, when we're playing with, uh, with the photographs, in, in walking around, too, in the city, Mm -hmm. There's as much nature going on there because we are part of nature. Right. And so that looking at that intersection and the stories that are told there. Well, you have some urban images, some photos that you took of the city and what happened in nature. So let's take a look at those now. Okay. Great. So this one here is part of a series where I call it Sandy's Wall. Hurricane Sandy, when it hit New York, was a direct interaction. And when I go around looking at them, this is the overall picture. When I take a picture sometimes, I'm not sure where it's going to end up or what I'm going to look for. But then that becomes the object. There was something on the wall here that caught my eye. You'll see in the next one as to what it was. But overall, you take the photograph, and then the photograph for me becomes the object. Uh -huh. So there it is. You see there's a sign on the wall. There's some graffiti and some paint, and Hurricane Sandy had torn up the sign a little bit to make the message, I think, even stronger. You can see it says A.T. Cake in the middle there, and I think it said, let them eat cake. And the message being from Hurricane Sandy is that if you don't pay attention and live more sustainably, it'll be, uh, as in with Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. So this is a cropped image of the original. Of the original wow. one that you saw before. Now, this one wasn't part of that image, but of course, once I spotted the first one about the eat cake, I started looking at the wall. This was about 30 feet away, and it's another poster, again, that somebody put up and said, I think it said originally, less is more. And by tearing at that sign, I think uh, Hurricane Sandy was directly talking to us in a way, and that's where I call it the intersection back and forth, and telling us that you've got to learn to do with a little less and think of that as more, or again, uh, you... That to me looks like it could almost be a collage that you created on a canvas, but it was actually created by nature. Well, that's it. And, from, and it is a collage in real life, too, in a way, because people, the wall, concrete wall there had been worn and weathered over time. And then the people had put various posters up there. They also got worn and weathered. So it's a direct action of art going on between the two of them. My place, of course, is take along. The blues are a little enhanced in that. It would have looked a little grayer to you in the original photograph. And then this here, we always take things as photographers, three-dimensional objects, and turn them into two-dimensional objects. This was a challenge of some fellow artists of mine, which was to take our two-dimensional objects and make them three-dimensional again. So this here is a sculpture where I printed my photograph on very fine paper, and it's called uh, Antoinette, which again is Mother Nature saying, if we don't learn to live more sustainably, perhaps all that will be left of us as a species is uh, headless statues. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, this is a photograph that, that I really love. That looks a little different. Um, it was a wonderful palette that was out there. The photograph was a little darker, and you'll see about bending the light later about what I mean. But again, this is where I say, always take the photograph. I didn't have my camera. I was walking the streets, but I grabbed my cell phone. And in the middle there, you'll see there's a dog, which I did not see at the time I took oh. the photograph. <laughs> so that's the other part that's fun. When you're mining down in the photographs, you find new stories there that you didn't see at the beginning. That's really beautiful. So those are really interesting ways of looking at walking around and taking pictures and creating art from what you see. I really like that. Oh, well, thank you. So once you have the photograph and you've taken in your camera, what do you do with it? What tools do you use to manipulate? Well, so part of the whole story bit is that we're all made up of the same molecules, uh, the electrons and the protons, right. whether inanimate or animate objects. And so the tools that I use primarily is Lightroom. 
and I'm not trying to add colors to it uh, or change, you know, with mask maskings. I'm taking the inherent wavelengths of light and amplifying them or dropping them down at the different wavelengths. And then that can sometimes alter our experience of the photo in a way that then I think sends the message that I'm looking to share. So Lightroom is the program that's by Adobe that's yes. on your computer that you yeah. use to manipulate the photos. Oh, interesting. The two of them, Lightroom and uh, Photoshop, right. are both owned by Adobe and run by them. Uh, I grew up on Lightroom and I like it for this kind of purpose of doing the, the work. Yeah, well, I'm interested to see what you mean by bending the light. So you have a demo for us that starts with some images and then you're going to take us into the computer. So let's yeah. let's start that now and see how it works. Okay. So this is an example of another a photograph I call Catch a Fire because it spoke to me. It's taken in San Francisco at a bus stop on a very foggy day. The photograph on the, the left um, is how it looks when I took it. Then I did take this with my... Uh, phone because my camera was in the trunk of my car, silly me. But when I got it home and I started to develop it, you know with the moisture of the fog and the headlamp of the car behind her that there's going to be lots of layers of light in there. And then okay. that's what I was doing, was enhancing, dropping down the, over, the exposure, the overexposure. And so that's a silhouette through the glass with light behind it. Interesting. Right. So she wow. had that, yeah, there's a glass between me and the person standing at the bus stop that was kind of lit up with the fog that was just continuous in the air. Interesting. So the experiment that we're going to do or I'm going to share with you is, took, is a photograph I took in Morocco. And in Morocco, everything is pink. It's this kind of shade of pink, wow. the dirt, the rocks, the soils. And they make um, the walls and stuff out of the soil. And so it also is pink. So everything's so. pink. But your, I bet your art didn't end up pink. It did not end up okay. pink. <laughs> So this is uh, the series. This is actually all the same photograph. And the original photograph that these all come from is just plain pink. Uh, those are cracks in the wall. This is the wall around the old city of Marrakesh. Um, and so uh, that, but what I did was develop it. And the blue one, where's, where we're going to start, was the one that I said, aha, this is what I was trying to convey. Because Marrakesh was famous for the idea of being able, of relaxing, a different mm -hmm. world, an easier world. Many people here in the 60s and 70s went back there. Yves Saint Laurent right. was one of the most famous. And that blue really spoke to me, that calmness, and yet mm -hmm. the, red, the red slash where the wall was cracked, speaking up. Interesting. And so somebody came in and uh, bought that one and said they'd like to have a matching warmer colored one and challenged me. So here where I, as the artist, thought I was done, right. the challenge, I had to pick it up. So this is your computer program. So, so this the, is Lightroom. This is Lightroom that we have lit up here. And if you look over here, you can either follow the changes up here in the histogram. You'll see how that moves. But so I'm going to the touch top the right. Uh, top right. Yes, yeah, sorry. And uh, good point. And with, you'll see that that's on the screen are the standard ones that most programs, even just Apple's programs, have that you can do much of this work with. And I want to make it warmer. So what I'm going to start, let's just turn the temperature up all the way, the first two bars here that you see. And I'm going to turn the tint up a little bit, too. And you can see that kind of washes out some of that blue light that I had in there. And you can, this gets in too purple there. It's getting strong again. So I'm going to take it back down to there, about 3 quarters of the way. And then I'm going to skip. Oh, here, let's uh, play with the exposure um, uh, as we're going to get is here as well. Um, I'm going to move that up to get it lighter. Again, sort of around here, you can see it's sort of washing the palette, but the red in the gash is still now very prominent. Yes. And then um, turn the contrast. Now, when you play with expo exposure and contrast, you're affecting the photograph in a global way, so all of the different wavelengths. So sometimes right. you don't want to start there. But I'm just getting myself here the palette, and I'm going to jump down now into some of the wavelengths of light. So in the red here, I want to sort of turn that up a little bit here, get that because I'm aiming for the concept of warmer. So I'm just was, I'm giving you sort of the sense of how I experimented in. That hue didn't, I didn't like the hue change very much. I'm going to go over and then I play with the saturation a bit there. And now that was mostly in the gash. Now I'm going to turn the luminance down. And you see I get a little definition now inside that crack um, in the wall, which mm -hmm. I like to have. And so again, orange here is where you have um, uh, a lot of color or warmth, so I'm going to turn that up. You see the cracks along the bottom there? They can come more prominent there. Definitely. And now here, yellow is so bright and harsh that I'm going to um, turn that down a little bit here. I'm going to adjust the hue a little bit 
just sort of to get you see I'm getting more of a kind of a wa general wash again if I drop it off around there and then I'm going to move the saturation uh, there uh, let's see let's get it up here a little bit because I want to keep that see watch the bottom bar there see how that's so red now I'm moving the saturation the mm -hmm. cracks at the bottom yeah. So I move that up a little bit, and now here I'm going to take that luminance down. And now you see the whole nature of the photograph has changed. I now have sort of yellow and orange and red as my core colors. And I'm going to slide down here just into the purples really quickly. Uh, just sometimes to play around with that, I'm going to give it a little more luminance here to bring up sort of the red qualities in it. I'm still searching for warmth, and it's just playing around with that as you want. And then I'll give a little saturation of the purple. And you can see the change here. Let me make it right at the very bottom see those little right. red cracks mm -hmm. there that's what i'm watching change on my photograph a little bit here it's just tuning a bit and i'm going to turn down the luminance there you see how that makes it darker yeah and so now it's changed all the way if you remember where we started with that blue photograph right uh how different it is now and but it's still the same photograph but it has a totally different feeling and emotion and now i think we're getting i'm going to see watch what happens here to the wall it makes it a little smoother i like that kind of effect uh, to bring out the yellow and i'm going to turn up now the vibrance and now i'm getting more into the heat of the desert which is also part of what you would find in morocco and then maybe here let's turn up the and so now i've gone from a very cool blue scene to more of an electric which uh, marrakesh was also known for is all the Beatles songs and stuff yes. that were were playing there and so that was one version that I was starting with. And then, in, uh, you know, you can actually have some more fun. I said, so I never would have searched for this. I didn't find this, you know, I got so happy with the blue. So now that I've started searching, though, right. I say, okay, let's keep playing and maybe get another one out of this. And so um, that's, uh, I'm going to go down, I'm going to go back to those purples and see what we can do a little so bit here. So in Lightroom, can you step backwards to something that you liked before and then Oh yeah, so back? actually I, I forgot to show you here. Here you can see the before and after. Oh, interesting. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but yes, you know, the good thing about Lightroom that I like is you don't have to remember to save your photograph. You just, you're giving it instructions and it okay. saves it as instructions. So it just remembers how you move the slides. Oh. You never mess with the original photograph. So you can always get back to it uh, if you want. Yeah, and then there's a history in Photoshop that you can go back and say, oh, I want to start again at this part. Can you do that in I Lightroom can, as can. well? Yes, that's right. So okay. that's the nice thing about the digital programming, which is a big advance over when I started in photography before. Oh, yeah. If you, you did know. something to your film, it was done. That's right. <laughs> Plus, you get to be a developer here on your own computer, right. whereas opposed to sending it into the lab. And uh, I like that one. So, so what else can you do? So I'm going to go now at because uh, some people say I have a darker side. I don't like to think that's true. But here, so I'm going to move the hue down on the magenta a little bit. I'm going to play around in the darker realms here uh, of, of it. And you can see it's starting to darken up a little bit. You see the sort of the black moving into the top part of the wall. And um, let, me, let me pull the luminance up a little. There it goes even more uh, dark as we're seeing there. And then in the purple, um, I'm going to, this luminance you can see has a big effect on the photograph, and I'm going to move that down to there. Now, coming back up to the, the very top of the guide, I'm going to play here now with these other, we have the temperature, I'm going to leave that the same. I'm not going to touch the um, exposure, but I'm going to start playing here now with some of these, like the whites um, in, the, in the photograph, because there's a big field in there, and I'm going to bring that up a little bit to brighten it, but Notice how other parts get darker. So it's, it softens oh, the blow yeah. mm -hmm. and it starts to, so I'm going to play around always sort of, you can always come back to do it. And so I just, you know, feel it out because these all interact with each other. So do you do this visually by looking at the image, not necessarily the histogram or any type of That's scopes. right. I'm really, once I plant myself, I go back to look at the image to see how it's changing and if it's evolving in a direction that I kind of want to go. Um, I'm going to move the clarity up here to get a little more rigidity, and then... But this started as something that was mostly pink. That's right. It was all pink. All pink. Just like uh, right. the Catch a Fire Woman was right. all gray. These wavelengths of light are all in it. So some ways, I like a uniform photograph sometimes if you're going to play into the abstract right. world. Interesting. Because then you have oh, a wow, consistent... Look at that. So this was here. What I did was, of course, is on the vibrance, which is the main one here. You can turn it up way high. 
and which gives you, you know, sort of similar to what we had before. But if I take it down, the, the black on the wall comes up a bunch. And then um, let's wow, see what happens like if we turn the saturation season up. Almost a different season or a different time of day that's happening here. That's right. So wow. there now, this one I'm playing with the saturation and bringing that up. So this is what I call twilight, which is you when go. you're sitting there, you still have the heat of the sun going down, but the darkness is creeping in. So I have I've named this sort of it can be a triptych or if people want mm -hmm. and sort of dawn, noon, and twilight. Very interesting. Wow, and so this is this is how we, how you manipulate your photographs. You That's crop right. them first, and then you right. So move move your sliders in Lightroom till you find something that you like. That's Very right. Cool. And in the beginning, as you said, what do you look for? You can notice this was a plain wall, but those holes are in it to let right. the moisture out. And then this crack was not planned, and the bumps along the bottom you could see was where they repair the wall in the past. So that's what you kind of then you say, okay, there's something here. Don't know what it is in, until I Which get home. Which you'll end up with on your computer. Well, that's, right. that's really cool. Well, thank you. And then here's another image that you manipulated. What is this? So this is a before and after photo also. So this was taken on Divisadero Street, so right in the middle of city traffic. Um, mm -hmm. I had to wait till the lights change run across. But that is the covering on scaffolding when you're painting a house. Oh. And it, um, I Certainly shot some. Certainly not beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something people would stop to look at, really, and you would consider the, you know, the tear kind of ugly. But what it was, when I first shot it, it was kind of an odd day, and I was walking by. It didn't really turn into anything, but I noticed the pattern, so I went back at sunset. Now, it still looks kind of gray on the left side, but I know that there's going to be that, what they call the golden hour light in it. Right. And that I can play that up. And then the one on the right is a cropping of sort of the upper right side of that, the lighter part in there where the sun is coming through. And um, it's actually flipped as well. So when you go abstract, remember wow. always to rotate your photograph. And this one now looks to me like a forest at sunrise. If you were to go walking in it and a woodpecker yeah. banging away on the tree there. There you go. Now, it might look <laughs> like something images. else to somebody else. Exactly. Well, that's abstract. Uh, and this is kind of another example of what I like to do and why um, it's really looking at the patterns. What struck me as unusual here and the intersection of man and nature. Man built these houses up here at Sugar Bowl. And the, and the uh, icicles are bent sideways, not downwards, because of the wind. So I cropped in very tightly to work on the colors there and found those kind of very interesting. And then a step back uh, to the, the next one was the final photo, where the whole ice flow, and at the bottom it looks like waves. Really cool. So those are beautiful, and the way that you manipulate them is really very interesting. So we have time for one more set of images that you okay. created. And taking a look at nature, but making them more abstract. So I want to see what else you've done. And let's take a look at those okay. now. So this is a picture of the ocean waves at my home island of Antigua, made sort of Japanese style. Soften the focus, but those were the colors of the sand and the greens. And then the brown in the back that looks like land is actually other waves at the other end of the horseshoe of the, of the waves. This is a series out of those pelicans off of the uh, ocean beach in San Francisco. Again, taken to the abstract level where I've softened everything. And uh, this one I've printed up on canvas because the texture looks wonderful with it. That's really interesting. Uh, this is the fun part here is, of course, everybody shoots the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, how do you do it? Right. How do you do it differently? And this one is playing in here. The clarity, I've blown it up to make the white lines on either side on purpose, something you usually avoid. And then, of course, rotate. So is that just with Lightroom? You didn't do any other filtering or anything with that's, Photoshop? No, just, that's just with, that's just just with manipulating the light. The light. Interesting. And pumping up the, the vibrance of the colors. This one is one that actually I took just two days ago, which was very fun. It's called the Grapes of Wrath because it looks to me like a vine and the plants, maybe going by on train. But it's actually a shot out my window of the airplane as we were landing oh. at SFO. Um, and of course, the gradation of light between the sun caught in the fog and then those are scratches in the window that create the patterns that look like the grapevines. Interesting. A uh, million moments. Uh, oh, this like is kind one. of the idea of life being made up with a million moments. And this is a new way I'm playing, which people might want to have fun with, using the healing tool on the photograph as the paintbrush, where you usually, usually oh. use the healing to fix a bright light or a dot or some right. kind of smudge. Here I'm taking it and using it to smudge the photograph on purpose to get the abstract effect and the message here that life is made up of those millions of moments and millions of people that you meet along the way. Wow, very interesting. So you have a really interesting way of looking at 
your surroundings and finding little bits that people don't usually see, making it look very spectacular. Well, that's the really fun part about being an artist. Um, my sort of the good part is the canvas is already there for me, as opposed to a painter that has to start with a blank canvas. Right. But uh, my canvas already starts with something on it, and then it's a matter of sort of peeling it away like a sculpture. So tell us about where we can see your art. So um, I'm part of the Silicon Valley Open Studios in May. Mm -hmm. I'll be here in two different places in Los Altos Hills. Uh, and then in Saratoga, and then also I'm here at uh, some of my stuff. We'll be, always be rotating through the gallery house right here in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also have my studio up at Edge of Frame Gallery in San Francisco. So you've been part of the Silicon Valley Open Studios. What do you think are the benefits of that? Well, um, the biggest benefit of all is meeting the community of artists that right. are around here because um, they come from all styles of art. And at the open studios, I've always ended up in groups of people who use different media. And so it's fun to talk with them about art. The other part is the people who come to look at art, whether they right. buy it or not, you always hope somebody's going to buy it. But if they don't, they're talking about it right. and hearing their impressions. And so some of my abstract pieces is very fun. I put them on an easel. And if you ask them, which way do you think it should be? You'll, it's interesting to see how people turn it and say, no, no, this is the way it should be. Well, interesting. And getting the reactions of how people look at it. and Yes, because I, I love hearing the feedback, to hear what pe how people respond to it. Um, it always makes you think again, just like this. I was challenged by one person. Uh, and then also, the artists, when they talk about how they do their art, always also makes me think about, well, gosh, that's an interesting process that I need to be thinking about, too. Do you ever go back and change something based on the reaction? I do. I do. Um, sometimes I just say, no, that's done. Or next time when I'm doing something in the same arena, I'm going to play with that more. Uh, more often than not, it's something that you start here by accident, and that was what happened with the millions, uh, you know, that smudge. Oh, yeah. That I was trying to fix something, and I kept messing it up. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, let's have some fun here and moved into the abstract world, which is what I like. Right. Um, so taking realism and making it abstract. That's right. That is really cool. So thank you so much for being part of Talk Art. This has been a really interesting show. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. This was another benefit of being part of Silicon Open Studio, meeting you and, and all and getting involved this way. Thank you. Thank you.